Ah, unmute. Yeah. Hey, hey. Welcome this afternoon to um, History Chats. Um, and I should un should mute the monitor that I can hear. Yeah, there you go. Hey, welcome to the program. Um, we are, um, yeah, going to be doing doing um, a History Chat. I should have done this while the, the music was playing, but let me just finish this. Great. Um, yeah, we're doing some, some history chats. Um, this, this month we've been doing, uh, people you should know. Um, and we'll continue to do that, which is an old, old favorite. Um, I'm, I'm, this is going to be one of those examples that is not quite about a person. It's, it's kind of a larger story as well. Um, it's really going to be about the Updals. Um, but I picked, you know, had to have a per person. I think Anna Updal is a great, uh, introduction, if nothing else, because of the music that you, you've been hearing as we introduce these programs, um, that is a waltz um, that she wrote back in 1912. Um, that's not her playing it, obviously. That's uh, Jennifer Cummings, I think, Cummings, um, recorded a couple uh, piano pieces for us uh, a little while ago. Um, and uh, yeah, um, and it's a beautiful little waltz. And uh, it's a very interesting musical family. And one that's going to be, um, I think, an interesting... Uh, thing that you know that speaks to a lot of the the area's history here. So um, I should say also before I get uh, too far into this, I am um, in the middle of a bit of a cold. Um, so if I feel if I sound a little stuffed up, that would be why. Um, you know, is what it is. Not great timing, but that's how it is. Um, let's just jump into the story though. So story actually begins with um, the uh, Anna's Updal's parents, as as you do. Um, they were uh, Norwegians. They had been married in Norway, um, and they ended up um, and married in uh, and then immediately got on a boat and came to the United States. Um, I, I think, based off the chronology, um, that would have been about 1869 is when they immigrated to the United States. And um, this is a little bit later in life, of course, uh, probably in the 20th century. Um, I don't actually have any pictures of Carl. Um, as we'll see, he, he is not going to necessarily be around, uh, for, for terribly long into the story, but, uh, very formative. They come to Wassa in 1869, 1870 at a time when Wassa is getting its, its root. It, it, you know, Wassa doesn't become a city. It's still a village in 1870, right? It doesn't become a city until 1872. So, um, they are there and they see an opportunity to get established. Um, they build a little house, um, on fourth and Jackson, no fifth and Jackson. Jefferson? We'll look at a map in just a second. Um, this is their house. Um, and it's not just a house. It is also, um, it becomes a boarding house. Um, and as you can see here, um, there's a sign on there that says that it is the Scandinavia house, which is what they, they went by. Um, they are Norwegian. Now, there's not a lot of Norwegians. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. There's not a lot of Scandinavian sort of folks in, in the general sense. Uh, relative to, say, the Germans that are starting to come here by the 1870s, but there's still a fair number of them. Um, and, and playing on that, that heritage um, is one way to, you know, hey, these are people that, that will speak the language with you, you know, and if you're coming to, to, to Wasa to do some work in the lumber industry or something, you know, hey, th this can be a place where you can, can board um, with people that, that will, you know, cook the food that you're, you remember and speak the language and have that same sort of background. 
Um, so this is located. This is a plat map from 1884. Um, and you can see here, this is the Scandinavia house. Uh, I don't know why I said it that way. House, H-O, um, boarding house. Um, and it's right here on Jefferson Fifth. Okay, so one of one of the four iterations I said was correct. Then it was Fifth Street. Um, for context, um, if I can pull up, here is Google Maps. So 400 block the Grand Theater here, um, where the mall was and was in the process of being taken down. We're talking about this block here. Um, it's basically in the park. It would have been in the parking lot where um, uh, to to the Prane Dental or apparently what is now labeled Doc's Weapons. Um, I'm guessing Dr. Prain uh, has some weapons for sale or something, gun, gun shop. Anyway, that's interesting. Um, or rather, it's interesting, you know, this is the location here. There's not nothing really that, that ends up uh, taking its place, in part because, as we'll see, um, it doesn't remain uh, necessarily a... <coughs> excuse me. Um, a, a boarding house for very long. This is 1904. Um, same same area here. There's the house, right? Um, it's not labeled as a boarding house. This is now a private residence by the turn of the century, um, which seems to be the case. I don't know exactly when they switched over and they stopped uh, being a boarding house, but um, that seems to have been about 1900. Um, interestingly, though, um, I would you know, just to the south here, block south, you have the arise, uh, arrival of the Germania house, which is interesting, as well as the Chinese laundry, which. I will admit, uh, yesterday as I was pulling together some of the stuff while I was uh, homesick, I did get off on like about an hour tangent trying to figure out what the heck the deal with the Chinese laundry is, and maybe someday we'll get back to that one. It's an interesting story. Anyway, um, it is for the most part a story going to be um, uh, without Carl. As I said, Carl uh, isn't in the picture for for terribly long. Um, by eight uh, in, in in nineteen or no sorry eighteen eighty uh, he passes away. Um, or 79, sometimes I've seen. Uh, I think the, the official date is 1880. Um, and which leaves uh, Elizabeth uh, to raise, uh, to look after the, the house as well as raise their four children. Um, and she, she does that um, a little bit later in the 1880s. I think she looks a little younger here. Um, I, I ran this through an AI neural filter to just kind of enhance and remove some stuff. I'm kind of experimenting a little bit with some of that thing, that sort of stuff. Um, and I think it accidentally, I enhanced her face. Um, but it's not quite what the original, anyway, not important. Um, interestingly. Um, so yeah, they, they run the household. So, so this is, is the family. Um, there are Elizabeth and her four children um, in the order of their, their the, the, the senior uh, members, uh, senior age, older, older kids to younger. Uh, there's Karen, there's Lolly, um, there is An uh, Einar and Anna. Um, I think we'll talk about first, um, well, these are the kids, I should say. Again, I, I did run them through and then touched up uh, the AI colorizing just to see uh, in Photoshop. Eh, this is not bad. Um, yeah, so here they are. Um, they're the 1870s, they had four children, um, and um, they're going to go on to have interesting lives. Um, this is one of the nice things about uh, talking about a family instead of a person. Uh, some of their stories we, I wouldn't necessarily be able to pull a whole program on. They were very influential for their time period um, and for the people that knew them, but wouldn't necessarily make it as a you know, a full-on 20-minute program. Uh, but there's some, you know, in the whole, I think they're making an interesting story. We also have a great collection of resources from them. As you've kind of maybe been able to gleam from the photographs, um, this is just the surface of the photo family photographs um, and materials that we have from them, which always helps when you're putting together a story. Um, this is a really interesting photograph that I found. Um, again, showing the the women of the of the, the Updals, um, Elizabeth, Karen, Lolly, and Anna. Um, this is outside of their home. Um, it might look a little odd. It, it didn't, it doesn't look odd necessarily until you start really looking at the foliage here. There's a little bit of like a weird division. Um, and that's because it's actually two separate photographs of the same location that were then split, merged together, uh, which is an interesting way to do this. Uh, so, uh, you have, yeah, um, it, they, they, uh, I think, I think this is probably Lemke. Um, who, who took a number of these photographs around this time. So I, I'm going to say it's Lemke. I don't know if that's true. Uh, but he uh, cropped it very strategically to illustrate uh, that this post here is the, actually the same in both. I don't know, just kind of interesting to see that. 
it is going to be mostly the the four ladies uh, throughout the, the late, uh, well, around the turn of the century into the to the new century. Um, after the the age of the boarding house is over, um, they are going to the, particularly the daughters are going to then be the the breadwinners of the family. Um, and for that, we should probably talk about Karen, uh, or apparently Kate as she went by. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm going to read a little excerpt from her obituary. Um, from the Wasp Pilot in 1918. Um, so she had, uh, basically she had become a teacher um, a, a very early on um, in the maybe 1880s. I think she was like 16 or something when she started teaching. Um, so she was one of the formative uh, figures in the, the Wasa school districts uh, sort of merging and being created. Um, in 1916, she had uh, some health issues and she had a surgery that she just never quite, she retired from teaching around that time after the 1916 school year, um, and then um, unfortunately passed away from lingering complications. Um, I don't know the specifics of what surgery that was or what the deal was, but um, something happened there, and uh, yeah. Uh, but anyway, in 1918, upon her death, uh, the pilot ran a obituary that said that she was a real factor in Wasa's public schools, having for many years in the Humboldt, uh, for many years, I think taught, I think I type, type out that, Having for many years taught in the Humboldt and Washington schools, the things that stood out in her out strongly in her character were the her unselfish and gentile disposition, and her willingness to do her part cheerfully and smilingly. She was beloved by everyone with whom she associated, especially by the children of Wassa, who went to school to her. Besides her relatives and many friends, the Board of Education, the teachers, and school children will feel the loss of a true and ideal friend and a wonderful teacher. Um, and yeah, she, she appears to have been, uh, it, it really was a, a big loss. I mean, she was, she was not terribly um, old at that point. Let's see, she would have been uh, 40, 47, 48. Um, so she, she still had a lot of years of, of, of teaching ahead of her, um, and so it was a bit of a loss. Uh, but this is her uh, a couple, many years earlier inside the house. We also have a lot of really cool pictures of the, I, I kind of got uh, crunched for time um, on scanning a lot of this stuff, so I didn't get all of it scanned uh, well enough to, to share. Also, it would just be a big slideshow of, of photographs. But this is the interior of the Updal house. Um, they were a very musically fa musical family, um, and so this is their collection of sheet music here in the music room. I think there's a piano on the other wall. Um or maybe behind the, the photographer. I think maybe this is the kitchen. I'm not entirely sure about the floor plan. Um, but anyway, musical is, is important, um, as evidenced by uh, number, another of the sisters. This is Leonardo Theodora Updal, or as she was frequently known, Lolly. Um, she was a school uh, a, a teacher um, as well. Um, all, of the, all of the daughters ended up becoming teaching at one point or another, but she started as a music teacher specifically. Um, had a very, very good gift of uh, piano and, and a number, and singing, of course, um, the sort of musical instruments that would have been acceptable for a, a young lady to learn at that point in time. Uh, then she ended up going into public schools around the 19 teens, I believe, um, where she, you know, became a, a fixture, of, again, teaching music as well as other, other classes in the public school district. Um, and according to uh, Anna, uh, later in life, uh, talked about some of her siblings, and she, she made a point of, of saying that she made extraordinary taffy, she was an extraordinary candy, uh, taffy candy maker, um, and apparently she was well loved for that as well. Um, one interesting little moment in her life that I want to highlight is uh, in a, a, a program that was put on um, like I said, there's an amazing num a number of uh, materials in this collection that we have at the, at the Historical Society for the Updolls, including, you know, programs uh, and, and uh, you know, broadsheets and stuff for, for programs in Wassa uh, in the early history. And this is one that featured, uh, well, her sister here, Anna Updoll, we'll get to her in a second. Um, but but uh, they had visiting uh, well-regarded um uh, singer at the time. She she did the circuit, Mrs. Uh, Minnie Lee Bayer. Um, and uh, yeah, at Alexander Hall. Alexander Hall was originally, uh, was sort of a temporary structure that was put up. Um, they had the, the Opera House, which burned down in 1892, 93. Um, and then this was the sort of temporary replacement for a few years before the Grand Opera House was built on the, the grounds of what is now um, the Grand Theater. 
anyway, this this is an interesting little con uh, program because it is. Um, uh, she had set uh, Longfellow's poem, The Famine of Hiawatha, to music, um, and they had this this uh, talent from out of town come and, and perform it, which was pretty cool. This is the concert um, for that program, which was printed by the Pilot Review. They had a printer there. Very, very beautiful, um, very typical of this period. A lot of these, these small little concerts um, would be, be very well, you know, put together. These, these programs were not disposable. These were something to hold on to. And again, thankfully the Updals did because we have an amazing collection. Uh, we also have uh, what I believe is the draft for it. Uh, this is probably what they were, because you can see that, that like, for example, here, the program part, um, they have orchestra playing a number, but they don't know what that number is going to be. So they left it blank. Um, whereas by the time they actually went to print it, they knew that it was the Bridal Rose Overture. Um, uh, orchestra, Ireland's orchestra here. Um, anyway, very cool to see that the handwritten, um, sort of draft of here's what we want the pro with the program to say. Um, and we actually have the piece of music, which is, is very, very cool. Um, so dedicated to the YMCA of Wausau, Wisconsin, um, published in Wausau. Um, yeah, very cool. Um, so this is, this, this is one that actually is, is set to words, um, and actually goes on page after page after page. I think there's, I should, I should double check this, like 16 pages of this, um, which is pretty long, uh, for the time period. But I guess if you're, if you're setting it to lyric, you got to follow the lyric and it's going to be as long as that's going to be to recite. It seemed to go over pretty well. Um, and actually she got, oh, I didn't put it in here. Um, we have the, let me see if I can pull up the image real quick. Um, we also have, uh, interestingly, the, the, I'll find it just a second here. This one? Yeah. Here we go. Maybe. There we go. Um, so this is a document, um, the actual from the Library of Congress, basically saying you know, yes, um, uh, Leonardo Theodore Updahl has submitted um, in 1893, October 16th, uh, basically getting the copyright for this piece of music, um, which again, it's kind of cool. Um, it's one thing to have somebody write some music, uh, but it's another to see it uh, copywritten and and uh, presumably distributed and published. So let's talk about Einar. Einar's other interesting. Uh, he is is different, obviously. He is the the man of the household, so to speak. Um, well, not so to speak. He he was the the only the, a boy, only only son of uh, Carl and Elizabeth. Um, now he he probably helped out here and there at the um, at the, the the Scandinavia house as as they were running that around the time that they decide to phase away from doing that. Um, he actually enlists in the Spanish American War. So the Spanish American War happens. Einar uh, joins up with Wasa's uh, regiment, uh, Company G, the Light Guards of the Third Regiment of the so Company G of the Third Regiment of the Wisconsin National Guard, which went out and and uh, saw service in uh, the occupation of Puerto Rico. Um, now I don't think he was in, in involved before that point during the war. Um, what had been our local militia, Company G, was was not full combat strength. Um, that's typical of the time. They didn't necessarily keep a full group of people on um, uh, on the payroll. Uh, but uh, during the war, a lot of volunteers jumped in, like Einar, um, and they were able to fill the ranks. And then after the war, they they went back down to what they were. I don't know. I never. I never got around to looking at the uh, rosters to see if he stuck around as a member of Company G, the 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 uh, Wisconsin National Guard in the interwar after the war. Uh, but he does come back to Wausau. Uh, he's by the end of 1898. By the December, he's back home. Um, he works in the lumber industry in in a couple different capacities for a few years. <coughs> And then he goes back into the service in 1905. And he joins the 3rd Cavalry, the U.S. Army. Um, now this is um, after the Spanish-American War. There was a brief time in which the, um, the, uh, the Philippines uh, resisted American occupation because the Amer it, it, this is all, all probably more than we need to get into, but um, during the Spanish-American War, the United States seized a bunch of territories from Spain, uh, principally... Uh, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, Guam, places like that. 
um, and freed Cuba from their control. Um, the Philippines didn't like that, and so they revolt, revolted uh, against uh, American occupation. So they sent some some units like the Thir 13th Cavalry down to to kind of stamp out the insurrection. Um, so that's what he did. Uh, probably around 1909 um, into 1910 would have been that period. So he spent a, a better part of maybe a couple months in there. Eventually things kind of calm down and then the Philippines gets kind of quasi-separated. That's beyond our scope here. Uh, for the most part, though, during this period, he is at in um, uh, Kansas, Fort Riley. Um, that was the, the fort that he was stationed at, along with the rest of the, the 13th Cavalry. Excuse me. Um, during the incident with Pancho Villa at the Mexican border, there's, it's not like a full, it's a, it's a border incident. It's not a full on war, but, um, he probably would have been, uh, involved in that. Um, he briefly in 1917, um, he joins up with the 15th cavalry, um, which was saw service in, in France during world war one. Um, I don't know to the extent of where he actually served, uh, but I know that he served. Uh, basically, the, by the time that the Americans arrived in like 1917, 1918, um, there really wasn't much need for cavalry. So they were basically told, all right, demount, you know, get off the, the horses and then go, you know, relieve some of the troops in the trenches, um, which he did. Apparently, by the time that he retired, he spent four years abroad um, between, um, you know, Puerto Rico, the Philippines and in France. After World War I, um, the 13th, or 15th Cavalry was dissolved, and he joined back up with the 13th Cavalry. So he was, uh, in a real sense, a, a career um, uh, army man. He, he served in the Cavalry for his entire career. And in 1930, he uh, retired. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, retired from service at the, the rank of um, Master Sergeant. So quite the career. Um, and, you know, beyond that, uh, again, Anna later would, you know, recount the, the days of the, the Updal House when the, the Updal House was actually being torn down. Um, I think this had been the mid 60s. The, the, the newspaper talked, this is where she, she gave the little anecdote about the taffy uh, that, that Lolly liked to make. Uh, she also mentioned that I, uh, Einar was a, uh, you know, he was well regarded. Um, there, were, there were other uh, letters to the editor that, that kind of stated this as well as being like, Everybody looked up to this guy when he was home because he was the, you know, um, the, the military figure, the service that he, he provided. Uh, also a very talented musician. Apparently he could play any string instrument except for the harp. Um, yeah, so he came back, back home uh, and uh, lived out his retirement in Wassa with his sisters um, and then died in 1952. Oh, I should also mention, <laughs> okay. So the other interesting thing about uh, Einar is that for most of his military career, he is known not as Einar, but as Elmer. Apparently, when he first enlisted in the, the uh, army back in, I don't know if it was in the Philippines or when he was in the, the cavalry, uh, but a, a pay clerk that, you know, you went and got your pay, uh, he put him in as Elmer. And so he came back, he said, actually, no, my name isn't Elmer, it's Einar. And he said, oh, shoot, shoot, sorry, my bad. Um, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, you know, come back to me in an hour uh, and, and I'll, I'll fix that. Um, and he came back in an hour and the, the guy was gone. And from that point on, he was officially known as Elmer. Um, and I, I guess nobody bothered, he was, he was fine with it. So he, he stuck around, he, he became Elmer Updell. Uh, so a lot of the official records um, list him as Elmer, which is is an interesting uh, little little thing. I guess Einar isn't the most uh, common first name um, in the United States. Elmer is a little bit more common, but just kind of an interesting thing that that happened there. Um, okay, so let's get to, to Anna. So to just to kind of round things out. So Anna is the youngest of the four uh, Updal children. Um, she also is a published uh, author. Um, this is the first one that uh, we we have. It's not, in retrospect, the most politically correct in that it is, you know, it's it's not as bad as it could be, uh, but it is certainly taking part in sort of that Southern pastiche about African-Americans, eh, maybe not the best uh, depiction of them. Uh, I, don't, I don't really know about the music itself, but, um, um, you know, kind of playing into that theme, which was pretty popular around the time. Um, this is published in 1900. Um, around that time, she would have actually been on her way to Chicago. Um, she was uh, such a talented uh, singer and musician that she was uh, got the opportunity to study at the Conservatory of Music in Chicago. Um, this has been about 1900 and 1902. 
And it's interesting. Again, we have some, this is from the uh, uh, commencement here. Um, <coughs> um, it's pretty common for um, at any, any sort of musical school that you go to uh, recitals from other people. So amongst all of the, the, um, the uh, you know, concert programs and stuff that we have uh, from WASA, we also have a few from the Chicago uh, Music College. And I love this one. This must have been pretty early after she arrived, um, 1899. Oh, yeah, because it'd be 1899, not 1900. Um, I know she comes back and maybe gets some, there was a fundraiser that the uh, Tuesday Music Club put together around 1900 in August um, to, to help uh, pay for her tuition. Um, I guess that would have been after she started. Anyway, I, I love that she clearly sat there and made notes. You know, she was, okay, the, the piano, I don't know if this is this was the specific, the... Um, the performer or the the composition, but she she you know not good good not good, um, pretty good, about fourteen, um, not good excellent good fine, very fine. Um, so anyway, just kind of interesting. I I, I can appreciate uh, sometimes when you see um, things in the archives and you're flipping through program after program. There's something about having somebody handwrite notes about how they thought the pro program went um, that adds a little bit more of a human angle to it, which is, is always very fun. Um, she came back, though, after that. Um, she did not uh, pursue a career in uh, Norwegian opera singing, which is what she got a degree in, uh, or at least graduated with. Uh, not many opportunities here in Wassa. Um, she does continue to perform, though, on a great number. This is a great example. This is Jacob Bruder. Um, he comes here in the 1890s. He's like a virtuoso violinist. He organizes the first uh, Wassa Symphony Orchestra um, and other things. This is a, a program here. Uh, from uh, September the 19th, 1906. Um, and this is the, the program here. Again, I, interesting design here. I appreciate that. Uh, but here, you know, Mrs. Miss Anna Updahl is performing on this. She, she performed at um, high school graduations. She performed at church services um, of all sorts. There was, there was programs in German, in Norwegian, uh, from the Presbyterians, from... Uh, all sorts of things. Uh, just to throw some other examples in here, I don't think that the Updells performed in these, but just to show that they were very active in the music scene, regardless of you know their background. Um, the one on the left here, uh, which is just a beautiful uh, design thing, was a military ball given by the Light Guards in 1892 by Dana's band. Um, and the one on the right is the Wasserlederkranz, the German men, a men's German club, uh, singing club. Um, and there's the program there too. So anyway, just very interesting. I, I just threw a couple of these in here because they're very fun. Uh, not not all of them um, that we have in our collection, but a, a couple good representations. And of course, eventually, um, in 1912, she is going to write um, two, a, a pair of uh, pr programs of, of music, Freya's Waltz um, and Thor's March, both hearkening back to their Norwegian, the Scandinavian uh, background. Um, I didn't, I didn't scan this either, but um, we also have the, the letter from the um, uh, National Library getting the official copyright for Freya's Waltz, uh, or actually Thor's March, but um, yeah. And it is, uh, Freya's Waltz is the program, um, that's the music that we uh, play as part of our introduction every week, so it's very fun. Um, so just to kind of round out the story, Anna um, ends up teaching as well. Um, she doesn't for a number of years, uh, about the time that her older sister, Karen, uh, becomes ill and has to retire. She steps in and, and starts teaching um, and ends up spending the rest of her professional life as a, as a teacher, as well as, of course, performing uh, music where she could. Um, you know, it would have been amazing to have a recording of her or, or something like that, because she clearly was a, a, a big talent, as was most of the family in the Updells, um, even if we don't really have a, a great... Um, much more than a handful of sheets, uh, you know, pieces of music that have been written. Um, but an interesting insight, nonetheless, I think, into an interesting family. Okay. Well, I think that that kind of covers what I had put together. Um, again, usually I, I put more time into this uh, to prepare and make sure that I have everything in here, but I've been sick the last couple of days, so I apologize if this was a little scattered. Um, but uh, hopefully you found some stuff that you enjoyed. Um, if you've made it this far, let me tell you about some stuff. Um, next week, we're going to have a great program, uh, another great story here. Uh, Gary will be back to talk about Herman Marth, uh, who was the so-called socialist chef of Wassa. Uh, very interesting period in time in, in uh, Marathon County and, and Wisconsin history. 
um, and uh, interesting figure. So I won't say more than that. Um, I think that's all you need to know uh, to be intrigued, hopefully. Um, we also have um, a History Speaks event coming up this weekend. Um, the, the great Wisconsin author uh, Scott Spoolman will be in uh, to Wassa. He's coming up here, um, and he's going to be talking... Um, about the, the history of Wisconsin waters. Uh, he is a natural historian and scientist, so it'll be a little different, uh, maybe take on what, you know, say I would, I would do about the water, which is, which is always cool to get a different perspective. Um, he just, just published a book uh, this, this, by the same title, Wisconsin Waters, um, and so he'll be sharing a little bit about um, that sort of stuff. Um, so that'll be at 2 p.m. this Saturday, at April 15th, um, here at the Woodson History Center. So hope you join us for that. If you're around, it should be a good one. Um, yeah, I guess that's, that's probably about all I had. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll check to see if there are any comments or questions, because, hey, why not? I guess in the meantime, I can, um... Oh, you won't be able to hear this, will you? Hold on. Just play a little bit of the, the waltz here without the sound of the uh, projector in the background. Looks like uh, uh, Kathy Volkman, um, our, one of our artifact curators, um, mentioned that uh, I always heard about the Updal family for years, and it's nice to um, learn a bit more about their personal side. Yeah, absolutely. Same, same here. Um, I've heard the name, I've seen the box on the shelf, and it was a great opportunity to dig through and surprised to learn a little bit more about uh, the family. Um, which is always, always what you want to do in these programs, right? It's as much as an opportunity for us to. I don't know if this is too distracting here. Let's turn this down a little bit. Um, I was a great opportunity, you know, to do these these programs. People you should know. Sometimes it's it's hey, we could we could learn to, uh, to stand to know know a little bit more about these people as well. Um, so it's a great opportunity to um, you know learn about learn about it for everybody. So and I and I hope you did enjoy the and, and learn a little bit today. Um, I think I'm gonna call it there. Again, some interesting stuff coming up, as well as, by the way, our new exhibit is opened, um, or, or will be opening this evening uh, into tomorrow. So if you're, um, we'll, we'll probably talk more about that in the future, but a lot of cool stuff happening at the Historical Society, and um, yeah, I guess we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.